Today's headline is on the Caloosahatchee, the cattle herders of Florida. The Caloosahatchee at this point, four miles, is a deep and wide stream, affording easy navigation for ocean craft. From here eastward, the river narrows and drains an open prairie or savanna country. This region is a vast cattle range and inhabited only by herders and the remnants of the Seminoles. Some of these cattle raisers are wealthy and pride themselves in their acquisitions. Cuba affords them a market, and their available wealth is mostly in Spanish doubloons, though a great deal of it is in Mexican dollars. The silver money is kept in sacks, representing $50, $100, or $200, and never untied, passing from hand to hand for the amount marked on the tag. Every man is his own banker, and his coin is a good deal safer under his own roof than it would be in the custody of any bank. It would be impossible to rob one of these cattlemen of his money and get away with it. The weight of the coin would prevent rapid flight, and there is no place to fly to, if flight were even possible. Hemmed in by swamps and ocean, there is no safety for him who would rob his neighbor, for he could not get away or make use at home of what was another's. If theft were attempted, swift punishment would follow the offense. No useless judge or superfluous jury would consume time in determining the magnitude of the crime. The offender would die with his boots on, and there would be no cumbering of a court record with the transaction. The people of this region are honest from a desire to be so. Everybody's house is open. The merchant, who is always his own clerk, leaves unclosed the door to his store when he goes to dinner. If a customer should come in during his absence and want to plug a tobacco, he would take the tobacco and leave the value of it in coin in its place. If he couldn't make the exact change at the time, he would mention it afterward and square the account. There is no such thing known as cheating on the part of a merchant. He couldn't keep store if he was known to cheat, and he never attempts it. There is unlimited mutual confidence on the part of buyer and seller. As an illustration of the strict integrity of these people, I will relate an incident. A gentleman traveling with me lost a pocketbook containing several hundred dollars in paper and gold. The finder could have kept it and the loser been none the wiser, but he did not do so. He left it at a store for the owner, whoever he might be, and it was returned to its rightful possessor next day. One of these cattle kings, as the herders designate each other, is a miser and lives in a miserable hut with no company but dogs. He had boxes of doubloons and untold numbers secreted about his premises, has no visitors and no neighbors, for in addition to being a miser, he is a hermit. Perhaps fancy has credited him with more wealth than he actually possesses, but he is reputed the richest man in Florida, and marvelous stories are told of the gold and silver he's buried. As poorly as this miser cattle king lives, there are none of them who live much better. Bacon is their staple meat, and with all their cattle, they have neither milk nor butter, and fresh beef but seldom. With a climate and soil that would produce fruits and vegetables a year round, they have nothing of the kind except what is gathered in a wild state. One or two families of Fort Myers have done something in the way of producing fruits, but elsewhere about here, no efforts are made in this direction. Indolence marks all the movements of the people, and while they have few of the comforts of life, they appear to have all they desire and are as contented and happy as it's possible for people to be. The women are not excited about changes in fashion, and the men don't worry over fluctuation in stocks. Why disturb them in their bliss by leading them into new modes of life? East of Fort Washington are the remains of ancient fortifications, works of the mound-building age in all probability. The imagination of some has discovered the bed of a ship canal in these works, but there is nothing to warrant the conclusion that the excavations were made for the purposes of navigation. The works appear to be the lines of defense for contending forces, or else the two forts are part of a chain of fortifications designed to hold the country against an advancing enemy. The excavations are very old, as live oaks and other trees several hundred years old now grow where the ground was changed from its natural conformation. The archaeologists can find a subject for study here as interesting as any afforded by the artificial mounds of the western states. The Caloosahatchee is a favorite home of the alligator, thousands on its banks basking in the hot sun of April. Deer are found in abundance, and bears and wildcats are too numerous to make the rearing of hogs or sheep possible except in enclosures. Fish of fine quality can be had for the catching. Birds of gaudy plumage and ravishing song enliven the forest, and bush and tree of exquisite flower and foliage make a picture on which the eye delights to linger. The climate is all that anyone could desire, but when annoying insects of every conceivable variety are encountered by night and by day 
against which there is no protection, I conclude that this part of Florida could not, by any possible process of transformation, be made to meet my views of paradise. This article was originally written by a correspondent for the New York Sun. This story comes from the great state of Kansas, being reported in the Republic County Journal of July 3rd, 1880. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave, Hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.